Gospel of Luke, if I'm not mistaken. Luke chapter 24. It's one of the passages that I chose. The other one I'll get to in just a second. The other one is going to come from over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Luke chapter 24, if you were in our Sunday school class this morning, you uh, read this first passage of Scripture uh, in our Sunday school class. Uh, and, and I am going to mention it briefly, but uh, I'm going to go toward the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch of it in the middle. But it says, on the first day of the week, Luke chapter 24, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the day, third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. <coughs> now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. So Jesus says to them, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, hey, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, 
while he talked with us on the road and opened scriptures to us, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven. And those with them assembled together, saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joint amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law and the Prophets, Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power on high from on high. When He had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, He lifted up His hands and blessed them. And while He was blessing them, He left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. I hadn't intended to read the whole thing, but I felt like once I got reading, I needed to kind of fill in the rest of the story. And I'm just trying to emphasize to us, folks, the resurrection of Jesus Christ should mean everything to us. I think I made the comment to you earlier. If um, Jesus Christ did not come back to life, you and I are worshiping a dead person. Anybody have problems with that? Well, you should. Because if they're dead, they can't help you. If they're dead, there's no hope for you and I. I want you to look at one other passage of Scripture. Part of the reason why I was reluctant to read that entire passage because this other passage is fairly lengthy as well. Look with me over 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And what I really want to focus upon this morning is the importance of believing in the resurrected resurrection of Jesus Christ. But over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, once again, I could go through the entire chapter, which I don't plan on doing. But if I did, if you'll look, you've got 58 verses, 15th chapter. Folks, this is what our faith is built upon. We do. We serve a living Lord. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He's living no matter what men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, what? He's always near. He lives. He lives. He lives. Look at what the Apostle Paul, in writing to these Christians in Corinth, this is what he said in the 15th chapter. Now, brothers, 15th chapter, first verse. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. Folks, this is what our faith is built upon. It's built upon the resurrected Jesus Christ. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believe in vain. For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance. This is what's most important for us to, to remember with regard to our faith. This is of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter. And then to the twelve. What does it say in verse 6? 
After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. So having read that, the Apostle Paul is trying to stress to these Christians in Corinth, folks, this, this fact of Jesus Christ living is central to who we are as Christians. And I'm going to pause here just a moment before I go into these, these last, this last section of Scripture. In recent weeks, if you've been with us, I've been preaching messages about the importance of recognizing Jesus Christ for who He is. Because as a pastor... I see evidence within our society that not everybody shares our beliefs about Jesus. Not everybody recognizes that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I don't mean to spend a lot of time at this point rehashing, but there are religions out there around us that they do not share our belief in Jesus Christ. And I've used some of these. <clears throat> For instance, the Mormons, they call themselves the church of Jesus Christ, don't they? So they use Jesus' name. But do you realize that there is a big difference between what they believe about Jesus Christ and what we believe about Jesus Christ? They do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. What do I mean by Lord? That Jesus Christ is really not only... The creator, I know some of you say, well, this says in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So they say, well, God is the one that created the heavens and the earth. But how did God create the heavens and the earth? God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God was using what in order to create the world? Words. Right? And that how he spoke things. Do you know what the Gospel of John starts off with? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You know what John is saying about Jesus? Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word through whom the worlds were created. Am I misinterpreting Scripture? No, you can go read in, in, in Colossians chapter 1. It's one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It says there in Colossians chapter 1 that He created all things. They were made by Him and for Him. They say, how can you believe that about a person named Jesus? That's why we're Christians. And we've got, sadly, within our churches that end up, don't recognize the importance of understanding who Jesus Christ is. Jesus isn't just another prophet. Jesus isn't just another teacher. Jesus is God in the flesh. What do you sing at Christmas time? Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? God with us. We celebrate God coming down in person. And folks, it does matter what you believe. How could a person come to believe that Jesus Christ is really God? I know that as you go through the scriptures, you find people coming to believe that Jesus Christ is God by the things that he does. For instance, when there was a storm and, there, and Jesus was in the boat, and the disciples were very fearful. Oh my goodness, we're going to drown. Somebody wake up Jesus. Get Jesus up. If, if we don't, we're all going to have a watery grave. They wake Jesus up. 
Jesus kind of gets up and wipes the sleep from his eyes and says, does there seem to be a problem? Yeah, there's a problem here, Jesus. Do something. Okay. So Jesus stands there in the bow of the boat and he says what? Peace, be still. What happens? Scripture says when he did that, everything became calm. It wasn't just the wind stopped, the rain stopped, everything, the sea and everything came. And the disciples said, man, oh man, what kind of a person is this? They've come to an understanding that Jesus is more than just a man. When you take, and, and we will do the Lord's Supper here in just a minute, but when you take feeding of 5,000 5, men besides women and children, when they got ready to eat that evening, Jesus was the one that felt sorry. He, all of these people had come from out the city in order to, to listen to him preach and whatnot. And Jesus had preached to them, but by the evening he noticed that these people were hungry. And he says to the disciples, he says, Hey guys, I've got a great idea. Why don't we feed all these people? And they said, Are you kidding us? It would take more than basically a year's worth of wages just to give everybody a bite. Jesus says, Well, what do we have here that we could feed them? They said, Well, the only thing that we have here is just a little boy over here. He's got five little cakes of bread and he's got two small fish. This wasn't a man-sized meal. It was just a basic little snack. They said, but what is this amongst so many people? He says, stand back. They give it to him, and Jesus takes the five loaves and two fish. He holds it up to heaven and says, hey, Father, we got a problem down here. I need you to bless this. And then he takes that bread and the fish and he breaks it and he breaks it and he breaks it and it says the disciples start taking it and passing it out amongst the people and all of the men ate all of the men, 5,000 men besides all the women and children, everybody ate until they were full and Jesus after everybody's full says, um, guys would you do us a favor I want you to take some baskets out there and pick up the leftovers and they took 12 baskets out there and picked up 12 baskets left over. How in the world does a person do something like that? Because the person is God. You take John chapter 11 when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Jesus says, remove the stone from the, from the entrance to the grave. And the sister said, oh, he's been dead four days. Something's been, have you ever seen something that's been dead four days? Stop and check out roadkill sometime. <laughs> Park your car, get out there and take a look at it. You notice if the animal will get run over, check him on day one, day two, day three, day four. Tell me what it looks like on day four and what he smells like. A sister says, If he's still there. If he's still there, if turtle hadn't got me. <laughs> or a hawk or a Or a hawk or something. Eater. They roll the stone back. Lord, if that's what you want. And Jesus stands there. He says, hey, Lazarus, come on out here. Lazarus comes back to life. Folks, you understand what I'm trying to say. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we sing the songs in our songbook. They're all about our faith in Jesus Christ. And I know that I'm operating for buys here, but I've seen so many people in our society get sucked into religions that don't recognize Jesus for who He is. You do know that the, Jew, the Jews don't recognize Jesus as God. That's why they crucified Jesus. How dare you be a person? No, there's only God. Jesus says, hey, I am. Many times he used that, that phrase. Jesus used that phrase, I am. You know what that was a kickback to? That was a kickback to Moses when Moses saw the burning bush in the wilderness. And Moses went up to that burning bush and had that encounter with God. And God told Moses, says, I want you to go back to the children of Israel in Egypt and I want you to preach that they need to come out of Egypt because those are my chosen people. And Moses says, well, I, I, I guess I could end up doing that, but when I go back to those people and I say to them that you've sent me, who do I tell those people that you are? And God said to Moses, you tell those people I am. 
has sent you. That's why when Jesus ends up in the New Testament, many times he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the living water. When he makes these statements, he is basically equating himself with God. And the Jews said, uh uh, we're not going to have any part of anybody that claims to be equal with God. There's only one God. And I'm telling you, if you are a Christian, you recognize that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm reminded in John chapter 14. That Jesus had told his disciples there in the 14th chapter. He had told them, guys, I'm going to get ready to leave you. But I don't want your hearts to be troubled. You guys believe in God. I want you to learn to believe in me too. Because in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And if it wasn't so, I would have told you, I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is trying to get these guys to believe in him. Folks, that's what it means, that you and I are unabashed in our faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith is built upon this person, Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> Jesus says, look, um, I, I need to do this basically for the Father's sake. And, and, and one of the disciples standing there and says, well, would you do us a favor? Would you, would you show us the Father? And Jesus says, you disappoint me. Do you not understand? You mean to tell me that I've been with you such a long time and you don't get it? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Folks, if Jesus died and he didn't come back to life, our God is dead. Our God is not dead. Amen. Because Jesus lives. I don't know if you and I can really appreciate what all would have taken place with the resurrection. More than the resurrection, the crucifixion that took place. That body of Jesus Christ was terribly abused. We do know that that night that he was betrayed, that they arrested Jesus and they took Jesus to Caiaphas, who was the high priest. And Jesus went before a mock trial there. When the high priest and all the religious leaders dis decided that Jesus was worthy of death, they said, we can't, we can't kill Jesus on our, on our own. If we do, it's going to get us in, trust, in trouble with the Roman government. So they took Jesus and they referred him over to the Roman government, Pilate, who was in charge and they brought these charges against Pilate and they said, look, we got this man and he's causing us all sorts of problems and we just really feel like that he really needs to die. And Pilate ends up saying, oh, you're a bad man. And so he beats on Jesus and abuses himself. Jesus had already been up all night long. And then Pilate finds out that Jesus is from, from Galilee and this really has something to do with the Jews and their belief. And Pilate says, you know what, I really don't want to be the one that's guilty of making a decision here. So I'm going to refer Jesus out of my jurisdiction to the Jewish ruler. The Jewish ruler is Herod. He sends Jesus over to Herod. And Herod, for a long time, according to what Scripture says, had wanted to meet this Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus do some sort of miracle. And uh, Herod listens to what Jesus has to say and decides that he's going to have some fun with Jesus. So he takes Jesus and he strips off Jesus' clothes and puts a robe on Jesus and then they take and make a crown of thorns. They put it on Jesus' head. And then he tells all the soldiers, have some fun with Jesus. So they, they blindfold Jesus. And while Jesus is blindfolded, they come up there and they hit Jesus while he's blindfolded. I'm telling you, the body of Jesus Christ was abused. Then some of them, in order to make things bad for Jesus, they, they got down on their knees like they're worshiping Jesus. And they would take that staff that he had in his hand, that Jesus had in his hand, and they would hit him 
on top of the head and drive those spikes into his head from the thorns. And then after they've done that for a while, Herod says, you know what? I don't think it's my place to make the decision. I'm going to send him back to Pilate. Pilate gets Jesus back and Pilate thinks really, ah, Jesus has kind of been through enough. Maybe I can release him. The crowd says, no, we don't want Jesus released. We want him crucified. So Pilate says, well, I guess you want to crucify him? Crucify him, but I'm washing my hands. So he says to him, go ahead and beat him like you usually do. So they once again tied Jesus up and they gave him 39 lashes across his back. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but those whips in those days, they said that they took little fragments of bone, little fragments of metal, put it on the end of the whip, and after 39 hits across his back, I'm sure that his back was just absolutely bleeding blood like crazy. And then they said, we want you to take this rough cross and lay it on that bleeding back of yours. Said that Jesus, because of tired and dehydrated, had anything to drink, and he falls, and I've told people that when he fell, you can imagine the weight of that cross landing on top of him. I don't even know if he caught himself, but he landed probably flat on his face. And the guard could see that Jesus wasn't going to be able to continue carrying that cross, so he hollers at a guy over there, Simon the Cyrene, and he says, hey, get over here and carry the cross. And they take Jesus out there to a place, and then they hold him in position, and they drive these spikes through his hands, they drive the spikes through his feet, and then they hoist him up in the air, and people come by and make fun of him. And then all day long, people made fun of him. You had people walking up and spitting on him and taunting him and whatnot. I'm telling you, the body of Jesus Christ was abused. And people say, what can be done with a body like that? I've ended up wondering, I wonder if you would have taken the body of Jesus Christ in today's time and you'd run over his body with a train. Can you imagine that? What a human body must look like if it got run over with a train? Makes me wonder if that's not what the body of Jesus looked like after everything you've been through. You stand back and you say, can't do anything with a body like that. You don't know my Jesus. I'll tell you what I believe about Jesus. You could take dynamite and blow Jesus to smithereens. You'll never destroy the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I, I don't want anybody to get offended at this point. But please, if you claim to be a Christian, don't, dread, don't join the rest of the world in standing around and saying, well, I wonder what happens after the person dies. I really wonder if it's her life after death. I know that that oftentimes gets people's attention. They'll turn to, tune into these television programs like, is there really life after death? What happens after death? Folks, as a Christian, you know what happens. You know the resurrection and the life. You know that Jesus died and rose again, so all questions have been answered. Is there life after death? Absolutely, there's life after death. And I will tell you what, that new body that you and I are going to get is going to be just like that of Jesus Christ. You say, what do you mean it's going to be just like the body of Jesus Christ? I appreciate what Billy Graham said years ago when I, when I listened to one of his programs. He said that new body is going to be like when Jesus Christ appeared to those disciples when they were in the upper room. Following the resurrection, it said the disciples were scared to death. <gasps> they killed our Lord and they may be coming after us next. And it said that those disciples were in an upper room with the doors locked because they were afraid of the Jews. And Jesus decides to pay him a visit. Bloop. He just walked right through the wall. People look at me and say, you really believe that preacher? You believe you're going to have the sort of body that you could go walking over to this wall and just walk right through it? Sounds kind of like Star trek to me. I absolutely do believe it because the scripture says that's what Jesus was able to do. He is a prototype of what our body is going to be like. He'll say, you're nuts. Go ahead and call me nuts. I believe in a Lord who is able to do it because he did it. 
Billy Graham also said with regard to Jesus Christ that when he got ready to go back to heaven, they went with him out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus ascended back to God. For those of you that are afraid of flying, you better get used to the thought <laughs> if you're a Christian. Because it said that Jesus went outside the city and then he went back to the heaven. And there were two angels that stood there amongst the people said to the people, Hey, men of Galilee, why do you just stand here looking up to heaven at that Jesus being taken? That same Jesus that's being taken away, he's coming again. And I believe that that's the sort of body that we're going to get. Billy Graham also said in the particular interview that he said, that I listened to, he said he feels like that in our new resurrected body, we're going to be able to like mind travel. Mind travel. You want to go somewhere? You think your way there. Wouldn't that be nice? Any of y'all get used to that idea? I could. Especially if you ever get caught in traffic jams. I can't get to the Steelers game easy. <laughs> he said he could get to the Steelers game easy. <laughs> you don't have to sit in traffic. Hey, folks. Let's preach that Christ has been raised to the dead. How can anybody say that there's no res resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is our faith. If Jesus Christ is not alive, we might as well close the doors of this church. Because all that we've got to look forward to, folks, is Christ does not live. Christ is the only one that has raised from the dead. That's what makes our faith unique. Our faith is based upon the resurrected Jesus Christ. As I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, over 500 people, not just the apostles, over 500 people saw him once. We serve a living Savior. We are not like the other religions out there that place their faith in somebody that's still dead. We serve somebody who died and he rose again and tells us, look, this is what happens because I hold the keys of life and death. My life is a gift from Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of our faith and I hope that you'll stop to think about it. All of our faith is useless. If there's no resurrection of the dead, I don't know why some of you folks are even worried about saying it for God. If there's no resurrection of the dead, you can go out of this place and just live any way that you want to. You want to kill somebody? Go ahead and kill them. If there's no resurrection of the dead, if there's not even life after death, why do you even worry about anything? You better live it up while you can. And then let me say something to you. Even after you've lived it up, what good has it done you if you end up in a grave? So what? But because Jesus Christ lives, it tells me I better be concerned what happens after this life is over. Because Jesus says, you're either going to spend eternity with God separated from God. And I'm going to spend my eternity with God. Why? Because of Jesus. Amen. I tell you folks all the time, I say it at the nursing homes as well, I don't ever expect to go to heaven because I'm a preacher. I don't expect to go to heaven because I go to church or I do good things or I say prayers or give offerings. I don't expect to go to heaven for any of those reasons. I expect to go to heaven because 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross, Jesus Christ paid my price of admission. He died for my sins. You people probably never see me as Jesus sees me. Jesus knows, and I know it too. I am a sinner saved by His grace. And all of my allegiance will always be to Jesus Christ, my Lord, because He's the one that's done everything for me. I pray that if you don't know Jesus, that you'll know 
The biggest decision you'll ever make is what you do with Jesus. Whether or not you will ask Him by faith into your heart that you live for Him. If you do that, Jesus said, one of these days, when your time comes, I'm coming back for you. You're one of mine. But for those that end up rejecting Him, He says, you've got a fearful future ahead of you. There's a day of judgment coming. And you will have to give an account for all of your sins. Those of us that are Christians, our sins were paid for. Jesus Christ died for our sins. The wages of my sin, those of us that are Christians, the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid it with his death. I have now been given the promise of life because I am forgiven in God's sight. You can know forgiveness through placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach today about your Son, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. We know that one of these days, Father, He's coming again. I know that it's been 2,000 years. It may be another 1,000 years. I don't know how long it's going to be. I seriously doubt that it's going to take that long because the increase of wickedness that's going on within our land. But Father, I pray that when your Son comes back, that He might find people that were willing to turn to Him for salvation. That's why He came is that He might offer the gift of His eternal life for those that are willing to believe in Him. And if there's anybody here or, or that's even going to watch one of the videos, Father, that doesn't know Your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that they might come to Him just as those of us that are Christians did. And all that we did was come to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I really do believe that 2,000 years ago, you died to make it possible so that I could go to heaven. I want to ask you to forgive me my sins and come into my heart and save me. I want to live for you. Father, my belief is that anybody that will do that, your son Jesus Christ will save them. And Father, one of these days, we will be together with him for all eternity. And I pray, Father, that until then, we can stand up for the name that is above every name. The name of Jesus Christ. As we have an opportunity to sing a hymn of invitation, if there are decisions that we need to make, help us to make those. For Jesus' sake, in His name we pray. Amen. Turn to page 596 and please stand. services.